it's, is elsewhere, but let's, let's zero in on the Scripture and see what God has for us. And my heart is in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37, is where we're going to be like a springboard here for the message. The book of Acts chapter 4, 32 through 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought it and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This evening, I'd like to speak to you for just a moment about unsung heroes, unsung heroes. Thinking about heroes for just a minute, you know, Hollywood, it seems, I'm not the movie buff like our senior pastor claims. I don't know if he, he mentions that on, on Sunday or Saturday evenings, but he does on Sunday mornings. But I've watched enough movies to know that Hollywood has kind of redefined what a hero is, if you think about it. And it seems like it's always kind of the same. I mean, for the majority of the part, Hollywood's hero is a man or a woman who shows up for the hour, for that moment of need. They show up, whatever it is, the situation, and then it seems like they're gone. Maybe I'm thinking more of superheroes or, or something like that. They are just for the moment, man or woman, just for that moment. They show up. They seem to show up at just the right time, at, at just when someone's life is hanging by a thread. The hero shows up for that moment. It's also neat to, to see in that Hollywood's hero is that their relationships are often superficial. Think of it with me this evening. There's often a level of mystery about that person. People try to get close to that, to that hero, whoever it is, but they, always, they, they can never get close enough to really know who he is and know much about him. Even though there's great mystery about that person, there's much spotlight and praise in that person's lives. And I understand why Hollywood does this. I mean, it makes a great movie and a great character, and we, we buy into it. But I want to share with you today that heroes in the kingdom are far different than this. It's far different. Today we want to look at an unsung hero in the Bible. And to kind of set the stage here, because we've got we to gotta know the context of all of this that is happening here in, in, the, in the book of Acts is that the church, the first century church, the New Testament church, is incredibly successful. I mean, the church of Jesus Christ is a success and always will be, but it is incredibly successful, and I say incredibly successful because in spite of all the opposition and the persecution and the killings and everything else, the arrests, the, the, the beatings and, and the chasing down and the, and the quieting down, the church of Jesus Christ is flourishing. I mean, not just numerically, I mean, numbers, I mean, there's, there's passages of Scripture where it says 3,000 were added to the number that day, that day. But spiritually, I mean, you look at the context of all of this, and, and Gentiles and Jews were starting to come together and worship together. People were coming out of a, a, a Judaistic or Ju, a Judaism, a legalistic lifestyle, and finding this grace and this freedom in Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we have today. Cultural and stereotypical walls were beginning 
to crash down. And on top of it all, the Holy Ghost was moving in powerful ways. Powerful ways. One of the things that I say frustrates me, and I don't, maybe that's too strong of a word, but we don't really get a good picture of the church in the Bible. Boy, don't you wish you knew a little bit more about their worship service and their times of coming together? I mean, what did it look like? I mean, we know from history they didn't have their own building until about 300 A.D. I mean, at least uh, that's what history would say. They didn't have a building like this. They met in homes, and uh, we know there was a level of worship. We know that they prayed together. We know they shared things among each other. There was no one in need among them. They, they would give. Their, they were very generous uh, amongst each other. But we don't get a whole lot of pictures with this. And that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to read Acts chapter 4, because it gives us a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. And what I love about Acts chapter 4, it tells you, it kind of gives you a profile of what the church looked like in the first century, but then they give us a profile, or the beginnings of a profile by the man, by the name that they called Barnabas. Oh, his real name was Joseph. He was a Levite from Cyprus. But the apostles wanted to call him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I don't want to speak too much in the scripture, but it's almost like they wanted to give a snapshot of the church and what it looked like and the beauty of it all and, and, the, and, the, and the like-mindedness and everything else. And then it's, it's almost like they, and, they, and the Holy Spirit says, now give a prime example of a person in this church. <clears throat> and this is the first place that we find Barnabas. And you'll find Barnabas' name, he'll pop up all throughout the book of Acts. Barnabas, son of encouragement. They didn't want to call him Joseph. You're Barnabas. You are an encouragement, Joseph. We want to call you Barnabas. You are a blessing to the church. You are a blessing to the fellowship. In fact, I'll, this is a pretty bold statement, and I, and I believe it enough to, to speak it publicly. Outside of God and the Holy Spirit, I mean, what, is, what God is doing here in the first century and the Holy Spirit moving, I mean, that alone is powerful enough. But outside of that, God, this one, through this one man's obedience. Now, we're going to look at other scripture here. I'm not basing it all off this Acts chapter 4. All through this one man's obedience, Barnabas. I really question if Barnabas had not been obedient to the Holy Spirit, where would we be as a church today? Well, we know God was in all of this. His, his hand was in all of this. So we really can't give all the praise to Barnabas, but I want you to see this with me. <clears throat> We'll hear Barnabas' name mentioned throughout the book of Acts. Barnabas becomes a very trusted man in Scripture. A very trusted man. He was, he was that guy that you could kind of let loose a little bit. He didn't have to have a leash on him. You know, do you know some people that are gifted? Maybe it could even be an employee or, or somebody else. They're very gifted people, but you kind of got to rein them in a little bit because they're a loose cannon. They're like a BB in a bathtub if you, if you kind of let them loose a little bit. So you, 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 you appreciate their giftedness, but you kind of want to keep a leash on them. Well, Barnabas wasn't that person. He was a gifted person, but you didn't have to keep a leash on him. You could trust Barnabas. You could send Barnabas on a task, and you knew that you would get a good report. You knew that he would be a faithful steward in what you were asking him to do. In fact, we find this in the book, uh, in, in, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Listen to what it says here. Acts chapter 11. 22 through 24. This is where the gospel was coming into Antioch. And I, even this today, I 
I started to do a little research about Antioch, and about this time, there was, they said there was about a half a million people, and there was a, it was a cosmopolitan of an, of an area, and a lot of hustle and bustle, and a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, trading back and forth, and a, a lot of business was done in Antioch, and a lot of cultures. And the gospel was coming to Antioch, and, 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 uh, and, and, and this was incredible news to the, to the apostles that people were getting saved in Antioch. And it says there in verse 22, it says, The news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And who did they send? It says in verse 22, they sent Barnabas. I mean, this, just is, this wasn't just some country church that they were sending Barnabas to and say, Hey, Barnabas, go check out what's going on in Greenwood, Delaware, or anything like that. They say, Barnabas, we're sending you to Antioch. We trust you, Barnabas. It shows a level of his character. It shows a level of trust that the apostles had for Barnabas. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Listen to verse 24. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Again, the book of Acts gives us a little profile of this Barnabas. God wanted us to know this here this evening. I mean, everything in Scripture is in here for a reason. They wanted us to know this about Barnabas. He was a man of good reputation. He was a man of good report. He was a man that I believe could be trusted. He didn't have to be put on a leash. And they could say, Barnabas, you go to Antioch and you give us a report. We're hearing about people being saved. You tell us it's true, Barnabas, because you have a keen eye for the grace of God in people's lives. Tell us, Barnabas. Tell us what you see. And he was a man of full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas is a faithful and steady man. Apostles could count on him. The first thing I I pull up from Barnabas in his life is that I need a Barnabas in my life. I need a guy like this in my life. You need a Barnabas in your life. Someone we can count on, someone that we can lean on, a Barnabas, uh, someone who is steady and faithful. You know, I don't need a theologian in my life. I need a Barnabas in my life. Are you hearing me? I don't need someone that's going to give me all the right answers all the time and someone that's going to, you know, be my yes man that's just going to follow him around and say, yes, Matt, yes, Matt. No, I need a Barnabas. I need an encourager. I need one that has a keen eye for the grace of God in a person's life who's full of the Holy Spirit and faith. I don't need an exhausting friendship. I got enough of those. I need an encouraging friendship. How many of you here are done with fake friends, right? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you are done with fake friends? How many of you are done with friends that just want to be friends when times are good, but then when they find out you got cancer, you don't hear anything from them? Your relationship becomes awkward, huh? I don't need friends that's going to hold me back. I want friends that's going to push me forward. Are you with me? That's the heartbeat of my message this evening. I need a Barnabas in my life. And the flip side of that is I need to be a Barnabas to someone else as well. That's authentic community. That um, it's giving and receiving. That I'm not always the one receiving, but I'm, I, I in turn, as I am filled, as I am taught, as I am encouraged, as I am blessed, I, again, I take that. It's, a, it's like a, a river that is always moving. It's not stagnant water. It's a flow as it comes into me. And as I am blessed, as I am taught, as I am encouraged, and I give to other people in my life, I too need to be a Barnabas to other people. You know, uh, we don't, 
we try not. I'm not I don't, I don't want to exaggerate here. We, uh, okay, maybe we do watch a lot of TV, maybe more than we should. Look, we, but one of the shows that we like to watch on, on, on TV, and we're, we're pretty selective what we watch, but as a family, we like to watch the, mo- or the show Little Big Shots. Anybody else like that? I mean, I, we just think the, the, the kids and the teenagers, I mean, they're just so cute on air, and, and the things that they, can, uh, that they can do is really incredible as, as young as they are. And, uh, I mean, some of it is just, just all for the cuteness, and that's fine. And it's a pretty clean show. But we like watching. I mean, that's our, that's our big deal, you know. We're going to watch Little Big Shots. I mean, that's our, our family TV time. But what I've noticed is that all the time, you know, they'll have... They'll be on the stage there with Steve Harvey, and I don't know if you've seen the show, and he has like the the couch up there, big red couch, and he's sitting up there with the six-year-old or the ten-year-old or whatever, and you kind of know Steve Harvey, and and he's going back and forth. And and one of the things he always asks, it seems like he always asks every show, he's like, so who's with you here today? Who is that? And I guess they got a special seating for whoever's with them. And 90% of the time, it's family, it's it's parents, it's aunts, it's grandparents grandparents or sometimes it's been coaches we've seen that if they're real good at gymnastics or or singing or whatever they'll they'll have they'll have their coach there but there's always a corner the unsung heroes in this person life that's been there for them it's been the parents that have taken them to practice who has who's watched them fall a hundred times over who's helped them up who's packed their snacks who's you know at the late night practices run through the drive through at mcdonald's and they've done all these things and it's the unsung here it's the coaches who have been patient with them and work with them and work with them and if it wasn't for the people that are up there in the in the corners that believed in them and poured into their lives They wouldn't be there today. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I need a Barnabas in my life. And I need to be a Barnabas in someone else's life. What else I like about Barnabas is that he was relational. Barnabas was relational. He seemed to find favor with people. This unsung hero wasn't trying to blaze some trail we don't gather that from scripture like like Barnabas was going to blaze some trail and he was going to set up this super ministry all on his own or anything like that we don't gather that in fact we see a man who humbled himself and he gave all in in Acts chapter 4 that it says Barnabas he he owned land there and he gave it he just gave it he says I'm all in guys I'm all in do with it what you want I'm all in for this kingdom He gave sacrificially to the church. The leader said, go to Antioch. Barnabas says, I'm going to Antioch because they asked me to go. Barnabas was all in. He was relational. He wasn't about him or any agenda. It was all about the people and and the gospel and, and this gospel getting into people and seeing the potential in people and pulling it out. Let's look at some more scripture that kind of backs this up. It's in the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. Listen to what it says here, 9, 26 through 28. This is soon right after Paul was saved. And for those of you who may not be up on scripture, on the stories here in the scripture, there was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus who persecuted the church. In fact, it is the cloaks of those who were killing a Christian at one time or were at his feet as almost left, as if he was standing there. This was his approval. If we could, and I don't think this is a far stretch to say this, that Saul of Tarsus would be like a modern day terrorist for today. But God stepped into this Saul's life and And the gospel and Jesus came into Saul's life. And from then on, his name even changed. He became the Apostle Paul. And it says here, when he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Listen to what's being said here. But they were still afraid of him, and rightly so. I mean, just think about somebody that was a known terrorist. And then all of a sudden, they're saying, I'm saved. 
I know Jesus as my Savior, and he was, He's coming into church here. Wouldn't you still be a little, there'd be a little bit of doubt, there'd be a little bit of fear there? That's what was going on. They didn't quite, they were still afraid of him. They weren't sure about this, this Saul of Tarsus, who now is this apostle Paul. They weren't believing he was really a disciple. But verse 27 says this. But Barnabas, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas. Relational. Barnabas really put his reputation on the line. Have you ever thought about that? All the other disciples were afraid of him. Barnabas wasn't. I read one commentary. We can't prove it in Scripture, but I thought it would be worth sharing. It says that perhaps Barnabas and Paul went to the same school, schooling together. Paul had some of the highest education there was at that time, and they believed that Barnabas would have had too, and that perhaps they, there, was a, there was already a prior relationship there. I don't know about any of that. But again, Barnabas saw the keen eye of the grace of God in, in Paul's life. And he says, I know the other, what the other disciples are saying, but I believe in you, Paul. I believe the gift that, that God has implanted in you and what God's going to do through you. Let's go to the apostles. I will speak up on your behalf. That's a, that's a man who, who believes in the calling in a person's life. He's relational. I need that in my life. I need a Barnabas. You know, it, it kind of brings me to another point here that we all have different levels of relationship. Barnabas, I'm sure, had different levels of relationship. But for some reason, Barnabas and Paul, it was, became a very special relationship. Barnabas became a key person because he was a trusted person and he was, he was a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith and they, they, they knew that they could trust Barnabas, and that when he would, when Barnabas would say, Paul is the real deal, they could believe him. There was different levels of, of relationships. You know, Jesus had different levels of relationships, and we're going to have different levels of relationships. Not everyone in our life can be a Barnabas, and we can't be a Barnabas to everyone in our life. We're going to have different levels of relationships, and I want to encourage you this evening to say, that's okay. That's okay. This whole series is about friends, and I want you to be encouraged that you're going to have, there's going to be some acquaintances in the kingdom, if I can say it that way. You know, you look at the different levels of relationship in Jesus' life. And just the ones who believed in him, not, let alone the zealots and let alone the, the Pharisees and let alone the Roman government and let alone the, the, the Gentiles and let alone those who were atheists and all, all the different relationships out there, but just the ones who followed him. You look at the different levels of relationships. Jesus had the multitudes that would follow him, and they they were going around, and they loved because he spoke with authority, and they loved his teaching. And they had the multitudes, but he didn't have a very deep relationship with them. And then the scripture talks about Jesus had the 70 disciples. They were more than the multitudes. They They were the disciples. They were the ones, Jesus, in one account, he sent out the 70 disciples. But then Jesus even had even a little deeper relationship. He had the 12, in which we're all familiar with, the 12 disciples. That was a little, that was a little deeper, a little closer. They, they saw there was a little special teaching and time with Jesus, unlike the multitudes, unlike the 70. But even deeper than that, there was the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, that 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 Jesus even had even a a special relationship with. We saw that they were the ones invited to the Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't the twelve that were invited. It was Peter, James, and John that that got to see the the uh, transfiguration on the mount that day, to see Jesus in all of his glory. The others didn't get to see it. It was Peter, James, and John. There was a special relationship with those three. But then it even gets closer to that. There was... The one whom Jesus loved, the scripture talks about, and they believe that is John. 
the beloved. Jesus had different levels of relationship. And we're going to have different levels of relationships. We can't be deep friends with everyone, but there should be a few people in our lives that we connect with on a deeper level. I want you to hear that. It concerns me when a man or a woman wants to isolate themselves. At the other church, at the leadership and pastoral leadership, I've seen it time and time again. When they start, when they start missing church, they don't come to the you know whatever meetings. They the ones that used to be there all the time, and then you'd see them in the in the foyer, and and all of a sudden you don't know what happened there, but now all of a sudden your conversation with them is very short and cold and awkward. All of a sudden, something's going on in their life. It's never a good thing to isolate yourself. I've seen it in a recovery home. I was director of two recovery homes. I've seen it in both of them. Church, I'm telling you, it is, a, it is a, almost a gospel truth that when people begin to isolate themselves and they begin to back out, something is going on in their life and, it, and, it, and, it, and they're putting themselves in, an, in a position for the enemy to devour them. I feel like what I'm getting ready to say, I've said hundreds of times. But that's probably an exaggeration. I know I've said it here before. I know I've said it at other churches preaching. But maybe someone needs to hear this this evening. The enemy wants, the enemy of your soul wants isolation in your life. If he can pull you away if he can make you feel alone, if he can, he, can, he can just make you feel disconnected, make you feel unloved and unworthy and all these things, then he can, he can use you as a playground. The enemy wants isolation in your life. God wants insulation in your life. And what I mean by that is the family of God, the fellowship, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the brothers and, and sisters. There is a level of protection and insulation with relationships in God's kingdom. God wants insulation in your life. Relationships are going to be at different levels. And you can even see that in Barnabas' life. I don't know if we'll get to that this evening. Uh, and, and, and sometimes relationships are seasonal. And I, and I just want to encourage you here in relationships because sometimes we beat ourselves up. I know some of my relationships in my life have been seasonal. I mean, there, when I got saved in prison, there was a man by the name of Harold Hall who came in there. and that, He was my Barnabas when I was in prison. He was the one that encouraged me, and he taught me how to pray, and he taught me how to read the Bible. He was my Barnabas in that season of my life. And I don't have a relationship with Harold Hall, not because anything went wrong or anything like It's just a different season of our life. Acts 15 tells us how after Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, they had a disagreement whether or not if John Mark should continue on. And Barnabas wanted John Mark, and Paul didn't. They, there was this disagreement. Paul said, I don't want Barnabas to go with us again. That guy abandoned us. He left us. And after that, Barnabas took John Mark, because that's just what Barnabas does. He says, I'll take him. I'll take John Mark. And Paul took Silas. Different season, different paths, but the calling never changed in their life. And what else I see in Barnabas' life that made him a successful follower is that he was a man who cultivated his call and cultivated the call in others. You can kind of see a progression of this in Scripture. Acts chapter 4, we can see that this is the kind of person he, he is. I'm all in for the kingdom. And he, he lays the money at the apostles' feet. Acts chapter 9, he has a great relationship with apostles. In Acts chapter 11, he's a man full of the Holy Spirit and good report. And he's sent to Antioch to, to, to minister there at that new church. In Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit sends him and Paul by the laying on of hands to go, and I put in quotes here, the work 
God had prepared for them. Cultivated a call in his life. You know, that's what good relationships ought to do. The good Barnabas in your life ought to be cultivating your call. Whatever that is, all of us in here have a call in our life. You know, that person should be, should be cultivating that call. I have a few pastors in my life, and uh, they don't go to this church, but i got one there and, and back at home, and I've got some in other states, and we've got similar callings and passions in our life. And, and, some, and for some of us, our stories are the same, and we connect like that, and we, we encourage each other. Whenever we get a chance to get together, we encourage each other in the Lord. And we cultivate each other's call in our life. Barnabas is this unsung hero because he kind of walked alongside Bar- or Barnabas walked alongside Paul and, and, he, and, he, and he cultivated Paul's gifting in his life. And we read in Galatians 2, 1 that he even 14 years later he presented Paul again to the, to the apostles and it was then that they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship in Galatians 2, 1. Barnabas is the unsung hero in this scripture because we don't, we, he doesn't get, it's often Paul that gets the praise throughout the New Testament. He is the one that has written two thirds of the New Testament. And we, Barnabas didn't, we don't have any, at least in, our, in the scriptures that we have, we don't have any writings of Barnabas. It seems to be all about Paul, but really, where would Paul be if it wasn't for a Barnabas that walked alongside of him? Relationships are a huge part for cultivating the call in our lives. I don't want to sound sterile or robotic, but one of the main reasons you are left here on earth is to fulfill what God has for you. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? And I would suggest that you can't do it alone, church. You need a Barnabas. Ladies, you need to partner up with another lady that can help you cultivate your call. Men, you need to partner up with another man that can help you cultivate the call in your life. Your call is such an important part of your life. Relationships may come and go. There may be different levels of relationship, may different seasons of life in relationships, but you know that call of God is constant in our lives. In 2003, I was trying to remember the exact year. Um, I think it was right around 2003, somewhere between 2002 and 2004. I was given this book by, well, now he's a, he's a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Penn Clark. Uh, it's not even a book, it's a study book. Uh, like, uh, yeah. and, uh, and this isn't a promotion for his study book at all, please. I'm, I'm not at all. But this here was strategic for me as I, as I went through this in 2003 and the importance of cultivating a call in a person's life. In fact, I'm going to read just one thing. and I want to quote here what he says here um, in his book about cultivating your call. Put ourselves in close proximity of those who have the same call or gift. Link up with those who are going where you want to go. This should also help us determine the kind of church we choose the friends we have, and the mentors we build in our lives. Read the biographies of men and women of God. Take time to walk closely with the Bible characters that you want to be like. If you want to be wise, you have to walk with the wise, he says. And that's from Proverbs 13, 20. Every bit of this Christian life is relational. Think of it here with me. Every bit of this Christian life is relational. It's no wonder Jesus, when he summed up the whole law, and I'm going to sum up what he summed up, he says, love God and love people. It's all 
relational. We can't get away from it. And God doesn't want us to have superficial relationships. I think we need some unsung heroes in our life, some, some Barnabases in our life. I want to close with one more passage of Scripture if Caleb could, could come up and, and play here for our time of closing. <clears throat> but I, as I was praying about, you know, Lord, what's, what's a good passage to close with this on? Hebrews 12.1 was pressed into me. You see, we, I think our pastor has, has said this here before, at least on Sunday mornings, that we're living in a culture of individualism. Just going to do it on my own. I'm, you know, they're just your own person. If you want to believe and do that and you're not hurting anybody, just go ahead and there's, there seems to be less accountability or whatever. We're living in a culture of individualism. And you know, the Bible is, I mean, every, that contradicts everything in the Bible. We are not uh, to, to buy into this individual, individualism theology or, or practice or culture. But the flip side of that, and this is probably where it makes some difficult with us, is that this is my life that I have to live. I, even though I have a Barnabas in my life, and even though I've got a, a, a godly woman in my life, or I've had some godly friends like, like Harold Hall in my life that have poured into my life, I, I still have to make choices, and i gotta, I got to live this life that God has given me. In fact, I, I like to use the language like it, it says here in, in Hebrews, uh, like... Uh, it's kind of comparing it to a race. I've got to run this race. Harold Hall isn't going to run this race for me. My wife is not going to run this race for me. When it came down to it for Paul's life, Barnabas wasn't going to run this race for Paul. He was going to walk alongside of him and encourage him and take him to the apostles and, and all these different things. But ultimately, Paul had to run this race. But I love what it says here in Hebrews 12.1. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's much debate. But what a number of commentaries would have said is that there's a good chance that Barnabas could have been the writer of Hebrews. Wouldn't that be interesting? But listen to what it says here in Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Oh man, my spiritual imagination just kind of wanders with that. I don't know, let's stand here this, this evening and let's just close our eyes and this... Allow our spiritual imagination. I'm not getting weird on you here or mystical or, or anything or radical like that. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I don't know where your mind goes with this, but I think of myself in like, a, in like an arena. And it's race time. And the people that are, that are seated all are in the stands around me are the ones who have run the race already before me. Noah is up there. The prophets of old are up there. Daniel is up there. Samuel.
Peter, all these different people that have run the race. Barnabas is up there. Such a great cloud of witnesses. And they're saying, you can do it. Run the race. And these witnesses are cheering you on. They're your biggest fans. But what's interesting about this race is that the ones who have run the race before you are seated in the sands, but the ones who are running the race with you, are they're down there with you. The ones, who, your contemporaries, your peers, they're down there, they're running. The, but this isn't a competition type race. This is a race that we're running together. And I look to my left and I look to my right and it's not a competition. If I stumble and fall, the, the ones to my right and left are there to, to walk with me, to pick me up, to, 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 to help me, because to, they want me to finish the race. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin and so easily attack, and let us run the race with perseverance the race marked out for us. And he goes on to say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. There's a call on your life, sir. There's a call on your life, ma'am. God's got a race for you to run. But I want you to know this evening, you don't have to run it alone. This isn't a competition. I'm all in for the kingdom. I'm all in, God. You want me to preach at Eagle's Nest? I'll preach at Eagle's Nest. God, you want me to preach in Indiana? I'll go to Indiana and preach. God, wherever, I'm all in, God. I'm all in. This isn't about me. It's about your kingdom, God. Your kingdom being advanced. And I know you have gifts and calling for my life, Lord God. You have gifts and calling for my wife and for my children and those who I serve with, Lord God. I'm all in, God. Send a Barnabas into our lives, God, so we can be found faithful. And Lord, allow us to be a Barnabas to other people. We can cultivate the call in their life and bless them. Bless them. We want to see them succeed. Continue to minister to our hearts, God. We love you. We praise you. God, I thank you for Barnabas' life and his example to us. Help us to be encouraged and to walk in obedience from this day forward. May you get all the glory in anything that is done. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I will be up here for prayer. Anybody wants prayer here this evening? Um, but you are, you are dismissed. Thank you.